right, I would like to call to order the regular board meeting of Tuesday, June 13th, 2023. As is our custom, we begin our board meetings with the singing of our national anthem. We are very honoured today to have a pre-recorded video of students from David Thompson School singing O Canada. I'd ask everyone to please stand and follow the lead of the students. to acknowledge the traditional territories and oral practices of the Blackfoot nations, which include the Siksika, the Pikani, and the Gaina. We also acknowledge the Satena and Stony Nakota First Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I'd like to take an opportunity to welcome all of our staff and public in attendance at this meeting. Representing our stakeholders group, I would like to recognize Harold Ludwigzen, um, and Chad Edmonds from the Principals Association for Adolescent Learners, and Claire Haney from the S Senior High School Principals Association. Our first item of business is to approve the agenda for today's meeting. Ms. Minor, do you have any changes that need to be noted? Madam Chair, there are no agenda changes to be noted for today's meeting. Could I have a motion that the agenda be approved as submitted? Thank you, Trustee Bolger. Those in favour of the motion? That is carried unanimously. The first item on our agenda is results. Today we have a presentation from Trustee Downey, Chair of the Engagement Planning Committee on the board's proud to be CBE school tours. Over to you, Trustee Downey. Thank you, Chair Hack, uh, colleagues, administration, guests, and viewers online. My name is Dana Downey, and I'm here today to share with you a trustee initiative uh, called Proud to be CBE. I am a CBE graduate, a former CBE teacher, and current elected public school trustee. I wouldn't be where I am today without the Calgary Board of Education and the exceptional teachers that I had. I believe that public education is the cornerstone of our society and it's our responsibility to safeguard it for future generations. As trustees, my colleagues and I have the privilege of shaking hands with many of our CBE graduates every year. This is a sacred moment. Our students are the future leaders and they deserve the best from us. I am so proud to be CBE. I'd like to share a bit more about this initiative with you. Trustees have been engaging with CBE students and staff at our schools to share some of the many successes of our public school system. We've been showcasing what the CBE has to offer, how we support our students, and what makes us so proud to be CBE. We have identified some of the reasons that the CBE is the number one choice of Calgarians. CBE students are successful. We provide choice for families, and the CBE is an integral part of our communities. Students and staff were bursting at the seams to share with trustees why they are so proud to be CBE. 
and I'd like to share a video with you from the Proud to be CBE tour of Patrick Airely School. I think Patrick Airely is a great school. They have great teachers. Recess is very fun for all the kids. The best thing about the school is it's helping me with knowledge. We have breakfast and lunch program, and our lunch program uh, includes a hot lunch option. Patrick Airely is just such a wonderful community. We are very lucky to be supported by the Integrated School Support Program, or ISSP, and that makes a world of difference for our learners. So the model is comprised of five essential elements. So we have a positive police presence, we have a nutrition program, we have full-time mental health support in the school, after-school care, and then uh, social-emotional learning as well. We just have some visitors that want to see the amazing work you're doing in your math groups. Hey, tell us what you got. Yeah. We have some supports that come from ISSP that, that really help to build our a resilient community here. And also we provide uh, a lot of leadership opportunities for our, especially our older kids, so that they can give back and to grow and build on their skills and abilities. The best thing about this school is the library. That's the one thing that they should know. Like it is very welcoming and kind. Right now we're learning about growth, mindset, and art. Relationships are of the utmost importance. My staff values and takes the time to get to know our learners. And by doing so, then they are able to support their growth as learners and their growth as individuals. Keep all the paints on the paper, that's why it's there. The staff and students here have huge big hearts and are willing to try new things and come back from adversity. I think Patrick Early School is a wonderful school and more kids should come. Wow, that is an incredible CBE school. Here are some words from Laura Hack, the Chair of the Board of Trustees, after touring Patrick Early School. We have seen firsthand the difference school staff and additional supports can make in the lives of these students. Patrick Early School has become the hub of the community and they are able to address a variety of needs that benefit the school community and beyond. The work being done at this school easily demonstrates the investment that the CBE and our partners are making in our students and thus the future of our city and province. CBE students are successful. Year over year, our students continue to outperform the province on provincial achievement and diploma exams. Our graduation rates are rising. This year also marked the graduation of the largest class of students who self-identify as Indigenous at the CBE. We believe that public education serves the common good. Students have a place to belong in our schools. All learners are welcomed into our system and our classrooms. We contribute greatly to a prosperous Alberta by educating one in six Albertans, and we are the largest school board in Western Canada. CBE teachers and professional staff provide specialized supports to meet the diverse learning needs of almost 24,000 students with special needs more than any other school district in Alberta. And over 34,000 English, English language learners are also supported in our classrooms. For those tuning in online, please take a moment to watch this video of the Proud CBE, Proud to be CBE tour of Lester B. Pearson High School, which offers excellent programming to all learners in their home communities.
The CVE provides choice for families. Families can choose excellent programming at community or alternative program schools. Choices include languages, science or arts-centered learning, and traditional learning centers or TLC. Starting in middle school, students can choose from course options including robotics, foods, construction, fine and performing arts, computer science, and much more. The CBE offers multiple academic and career pathways for students to complete high school, including international baccalaureate and advanced placement, dual credit, exploratory and off-campus opportunities, as well as countless other options. Trustees had the opportunity to tour Bishop Pinkham School, a middle school that offers regular programming as well as French immersion. I'd like to encourage you to watch this video online to see why Bishop Pinkham students and staff make us so proud to be CBE. The CBE is an integral part of our communities. Our schools are the number one choice of Calgarians. We support families by offering before and after school care in 75% of elementary schools, and schools are rented more than 23,000 hours annually to provide community events and programs. As one of the largest employers and land owners in Calgary, the CBE has a significant economic impact. CBE collaborates with the City of Calgary, other school boards, and more than 170 community partners to offer the best learning experience to students. For those tuning in online, please check out this Proud to be CBE video about William Roper Hall School. This school provides wraparound services for students with complex needs in grades 1 to 12 in partnership with Hull Services, a nonprofit organization that has been providing mental, uh, mental health and behavioral support to kids in Calgary since 1962. Together, the CBE and Hull Services provide the needed resources and services for students to succeed in their education. So what makes you proud to be CBE? We look forward to working with all educational stakeholders to celebrate, protect, and increase investment in the CBE. Public education is worth it. To watch all of our Proud to be CBE videos, check out our YouTube channel. You can also use the link in this presentation to learn more about the Board of Trustees' advocacy priorities. Thank you for this opportunity to share the tremendous success of the CBE and the pride that we have in our incredible students. Thank you, Trustee Downey. Next on our agenda is the annual, annual monitoring of Operational Expectations 5, Financial Planning. Chief Busi, would you please introduce the report? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I will invite our uh, CF for uh, Brad Grande to present this report, and uh, Madam Chair will be happy to respond to questions from trustees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Usi. Trustees, presented for your approval is Operational Expectation 5, Financial Planning. Before I begin, I would like to note that this report relates to the 21-22 school year, not the current 22-23 school year. The last time this report was before you was June 14th, 2022, for the 2020-21 school year. The final version of this report will be updated to ensure the correct dates are reflected. So my apologies for any confusion we may have caused. Trustees, date dyslexia aside, this operational expectation is fundamental to the CBE's commitment to being an open and transparent publicly accountable entity. Through this operational expectation, the public and you as governors can take comfort that the CBE is a good steward of the public funds entrusted to it in pursuit of student achievement, equity and well-being. 
That stewardship process begins with the budget assumptions report, moves through to the annual budget report that you saw just last month, includes the quarterly uh, variance reports that compares actual spending against the approved budget, seeks prior approval uh, for any use of CBE reserves, and concludes with the audit of the CBE's financial results. This report summarizes that cycle. As you can see, CBE administration is fully compliant with all relevant indicators. And with that, we're happy to take any questions at this time. The operational expectations policies define the degree of authority transferred to the chief superintendent as he makes day-to-day -day decisions. The Board of Trustees has previously reviewed the reasonable interpretations of this operational expectation and approved that the chief superintendent reasonably understands the value underlying this policy and that the indicators previously provided by the chief superintendent are acceptable to the board. I now invite any trustee who has questions about the report to offer them to the chief superintendent. Let me remind the board that the purpose of considering this report is to satisfy the board that its policy values were complied with during the 2021-2022 school year. I encourage trustees to limit their questions and comments in support of monitoring. I guess I'll just start off. I don't have any questions on the report, um, just appreciation. Uh, for how and when the budget's presented to the board, factors and risks that are integrated into the budget when presented, and that the changes that are constantly being made to all the reports for public consumption on the report. I've heard from stakeholders that's very readable um, and easily digestible, so I just want to take a moment and say thank you to the Chief Superintendent and Superintendent Grundy and all of your amazing team. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? Okay. We now come to the point where the trustees are asked to identify their intentions to bring forward any motions related to compliance with the operational expectations. Any trustee who wishes to bring forward a motion regarding exceptions to finding the evidence to be compliant or a motion of accommodation for exceptional performance in a particular area should provide the corporate secretary and all trustees with the proposed motions by noon Thursday, June 15th, 2023. If there are no exceptions or accommodations, then this item will be placed on the consent agenda for the June 20th board meeting. With the motion that the board of trustees approves that the chief superintendent is in compliance with the provisions of OE5 financial planning. Our next item of business is the annual monitoring of operational expectations, nine facilities. Chief Usi, would you please introduce the report? Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, trustees. Uh, today we present the annual monitoring report for operational expectations, uh, expectation nine facilities. The data collected for this monitoring report applies to the 2021-2022 school year. Trustees will recall that uh, during that year, uh, we operated under uh, the the continued pandemic restrictions and the associated challenges brought by the impact of COVID-19 on students and staff. Later that year, we also saw a dramatic shift as the province lifted many of the restrictions. The facilities and environmental services units plays uh, an instrumental role in ensuring that our schools are safe and healthy places that support learning. I am proud to say that throughout the 2021-22 school year, uh, that the FES team continued to rise to the challenge presented by the pandemic and live up to the board's expectation under OE9. At this time, Madam Chair, I'd like to invite Superintendent uh, Breton to provide additional uh, information on this report, and I will be happy to respond to your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair and Trustees, as mentioned by our Chief Superintendent, the 21-22 school year continued to pose unique challenges above and beyond those already present during any normal school year. And, and of course, this was due to the continued evolution of the pandemic and the need to closely monitor and adapt to the changing COVID-19 
direction that was being provided by the provincial government. These unusual circumstances resulted in our inability to report on indicator 941, uh, that indicator of course speaking to um, your objective of ensuring that at least 80% of schools are made available to the public. Uh, certainly an indicator that highlights your commitment to, um, to uh, and or I should say maybe your recognition of the important and central role that schools play within a community and the board's desire to support this role. However, it is shown as not applicable within this report since during that school year, of course, um, we saw public rentals continued to be excluded. This as a precautionary measure in support of the health of students and staff and a reflection of the CB's desire to maximize in-person learning after several years of regular interruptions and transitions to online learning. On a positive note, I do believe it is important to highlight that during this trying school year, the CB rose to the challenge of indicator 9.3 that requires 95% of schools and facilities to be assessed at the level two ordinary cleanliness cleaning standard, this while also continuing to support provincially mandated high touch point cleaning in all CBE schools, something that was made possible by the addition of temporary cleaning staff in every CBE school. And now with that having been said, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have on this report. Trustees, with any questions? Trustee May, go ahead. Uh, the report indicates that 45 hazard reports and 45 indoor environmental quality concern reports were responded to within the established timelines. Can you please provide some examples of what was contained in these reports and what work we might have done to alleviate concerns? And this is on page 4-12. Through the chair, so some examples of hazard reports uh, might be holes in a playground uh, that might ultimately have led to the dispatch of the grounds team to, to go uh, assess and address the issue. Um, indoor environmental quality, we might see things such as pests that might have been identified um, within a school. We might uh, have um, noise in a classroom that might be of concern and so then at that point in time we, we could uh, we can dispatch our uh, audiometric tech to support the teacher uh, and, and verify what is happening there or strange smells in the workplace and then again investigated by the indoor environmental quality team um, for the source and ultimately looking to control um, wherever that smell might be emanating from. I've got Trustee Dennis. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Chair. My question is on 5-12, and where it says 7,883 emergency maintenance and repair requests were received and responded to within 24 hours. First, I want to acknowledge what a tremendous number that is, um, and the fact that those were responded to so quickly. Um, so that is an increase of 1,719 requests over last year. And so I was hoping to get a bit of insight on you know, what is the nature of some of these requests and just um, some indication on what drove those requests. So are we looking at you know, machine or building components reaching the end of their lifespan? Are we looking at you know, vandalism reports, accidents, and so on? Through the chair. So emergency requests uh, vary quite widely. Um, they can be things that are unrelated to the um, building itself in the sense of how well it's operating. For example, I'm thinking of vandalism or a break and enter, uh, where at that point in time, of course, we would have to be responding immediately. Um, there can be other instances that are related to the environment. So if it's really cold out and suddenly we have a freeze up, uh, within um, some water lines that end up causing damage. Um, so it, it is quite a, a varied um, grouping. There isn't one area in particular that resulted in this overall increase that uh, we could point to. 
Our analysis just indicates that we had more of these types of issues overall. And uh, again, there isn't necessarily a pattern or trend that we can uh, attach to at this increase. Uh, Trustee Dennis with a follow-up, go ahead. Yes, thank you. So as you're answering that question, Superintendent Breton, um, I'm just curious about, is this something that we manage with internal staff or do we access a number of, you know, sort of contractors or outside, um, you know, businesses to be able to assist, you know, with this volume and our ability to be so responsive? Through the chair, and, and so the answer to that would be both. It's a combination. Um, we have staff uh, that we reach out to first and foremost because we know that they are familiar with our facilities inside and out. Um, but um, it, it, there are occasions where maybe uh, there are not they are not available, or uh, the expertise that's involved is such that we do need to go get uh, an exterior party to come in and address the issue. So um, it is a combination of both internal resources and then subsequently uh, external resources to respond to these emergencies. I'm just going to ask a follow-up question to your introduction here. Um, page 5-12, the indicator 3, can you just describe what level 2 ordinary tidiness entails and like what that encompasses within the school? To the chair. Um, so in this case, this is defined by uh, the uh, an organization um, that has established uh, specific cleanliness levels and their definition is very specific so I, I can read to you uh, the four uh, sections that uh, lays out and so for ordinary tidiness we're looking at floors and base moldings that shine and or are bright and clean there is no buildup in corners or along walls but there can be up to two days worth of dust dirt stains or streaks Secondly, all vertical and horizontal surfaces are clean, but marks, dust, smudges, and fingerprints are noticeable upon close observation. Lights all work and fixtures are clean. Thirdly, washroom and shower fixtures and tiles gleam and are odor-free, supplies are adequate. And then lastly, trash containers and pencil sharpeners hold only daily waste, are clean and odor-free. Trustees, with any other questions? I've just got a question on a six dash twelve, as others think about. They won't ask any questions. Um, so on indicator two, can you please distinguish here why this was marked as um, compliant versus not applicable? Um, to me, it would make more sense if we didn't do any major modernizations, just not applicable for the year. Um, can you just clarify on that? Through the chair. Um, my understanding is that we started using not applicable uh, actually through the pandemic as we started to um, face situations where we were reporting on indicators that due to measures and, and circumstances outside of our control, um, we could not be uh, reporting on. Whereas uh, historically, if, if there is something that we are, have control of, for example, we are in control of determining whether or not we will adhere to this indicator in particular, but it just so happened that uh, we didn't have modernization underway at that time, that uh, at that point in time, we would leave it uh, as, as being compliant. Uh, just the fact that there wasn't one 
ended up being sort of a moot point. Uh, but certainly, uh, on, that, uh, on that note, uh, we are, the administration is ready to, to, to follow uh, the, the will of the board in terms of how to report on those kinds of instances. If, if there is a preference for not applicable, then that certainly could be the, the way that we go forward. Thank you for that understanding. Um, Trustee Dennis, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I have no further questions on this report. My apologies. Any other questions? We now come to the point where trustees are asked to identify their intentions to bring forward any motions related to clients with this operational expectation. Any trustee who wishes to bring forward a motion regarding exception to finding the evidence to be compliant or a motion of accommodation for exceptional performance in a particular area should provide the corporate secretary and all trustees with the proposed motion by noon, Thursday, June 15th, 2023. If there are no exceptions or accommodations, then this item will be placed on the consent agenda for the June 20th board meeting with the motion that the Board of Trustees approves that the Chief Superintendent is in compliance with the provisions of OE9 facilities. Our next uh, agenda item is item 7.1, Education Matters presentation and financial statements. We're very pleased to have Hanif Lauda and Chair of the Education Matters Board of Governors and Marilyn Fields, Executive Director of Education Matters here today for this presentation. Mr. Lauda and Ms. Fields, would you please come to the podium and I'll turn on over the meeting uh, to you for presentation. Thank you, uh, Chair Hack. Good afternoon, Chair Hack, CBE trustees, Chief Superintendent uh, UC, staff and viewers online. <clears throat> My name is Hani Flada, the Education Matters Chair of the Board of Governors. And joining me today is our Executive Director, Marilyn Field. It's nice to see everyone's smiling faces and to meet in person. A special shout out to Trustees Bolger and Downey as CBE trustee representatives on the Education Matters Board of Governors and thank them for their hard work and insights uh, with the board. On behalf of Education Matters Board of Governors, we'd like to acknowledge the strong working relationship with the CBE trustees and thank you for your support. We look forward to continuing this collaborative approach in achieving Education Matters vision of providing excellent learning opportunities for all students. I would also like to particularly thank Marla Martin Esposito for her valuable contributions to our board, Chief Superintendent UC, and the entire CBE staff for their inclusive approach and working with Education Matters operational team and the board. On a more personal note, we wish Chief Superintendent, Superintendent Yusi all the best as he embarks on a new journey. The success, maybe my time's up. <laughs> <laughs> the success of Education Matters is also due to the hard work of Marilyn and her team and appreciate their dedication and tenacity throughout one of the most challenging periods. Thank you for allowing us to share some highlights from a successful 2022. As we exceeded fundraising expectations and our ultimate goal by enhancing CBE student success. I hope this presentation helps to synthesize the information contained in Education Matters accompanying audited financials, provide an update to Education Matters strategic plan that is in alignment with CBE's education plan and sharing numerous accomplishments. As you can see, our Board of Governors consists of 10 community volunteers and the two CBE trustee rep representatives, comprising of a diverse group of individuals with different skill sets and backgrounds with numerous committee members supporting the Board of Governors. 
The board is actively recruiting for additional governors and committee members to strengthen our reach. As you know, Education Matters is a charitable trust and we are governed under the terms of our trust indenture, which identify our purpose as advancing and enhancing education for CBE public education students. It is a purpose that aligns well with the CBE's goal to bring equity and success for all students across the city. 2023 will be Education Matters 20th anniversary of existence. And we are excited about celebrating this achievement with CBE and its students and the community at large. <clears throat> I am pleased to inform CBE that Education Matters raised over $2.8 million and distributed $2.4 million in the 2022 calendar year. The dedicated endowments donors provide to support student awards and granting experienced, sorry, and granting experienced losses due to the investment environment over the past year, and now sit at 6.1 or 6 million. As noted earlier, more than half of the disbursements support grants for education programs within CBE. In September 2020, Education Matters began processing tax receipted gifts for CVE to capitalize efficiencies between both organizations. In 2022, donation processing through Education Matters issued charitable receipts totaling $322,954 from 946 donations for CBE generated donations, which is included in the 2022 raise total. Over to you, Marilyn. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Hack, trustees, Chief Superintendent Usi, CBE staff, and all guests. Thank you for offering us this opportunity to present our 2022 outcomes. The chart on this slide represents the financial outcomes for each area since inception. When we look at the distributions for the past seven years, Education Matters received $4.35 million in operational funding, and we raised in excess of $13 million and distributed $8.4 million in educational enhancement grants and $3.4 million in student awards. CBE has realized a 65% return on the operational grant investment in Education Matters through the grant distributions for CBE students and schools over the past seven years. This does not include the funds distributed through student awards. Let's break this down into more manageable chunks. Education Matters is showing significant success in securing financial support from the community over the years with $26 million raised to support students. That to me is pretty exciting. In the post-pandemic year, our team successfully achieved 2.8 million from donors in donations. <clears throat> Excuse me. The trends we continue to see in fundraising include a desire for donors to support specific and defined projects and fewer area of greatest needs contributions. But in that respect, we are shifting our focus somewhat to try and encourage donors to support more areas of interest that will allow us to build funds in areas such as, for learning such as Indigenous education, career programs, and other similar priorities. Since Education Matters was established, in excess of $20.5 million has been dispersed in grants and student awards. As you can see, the majority of the disbursements are consistently for educational enhancement grants, with students' awards <clears throat> representing approximately one-third of the distributions. But let's drill that down even further. <coughs> Looking at grants specifically, over a past seven-year period, we can see that granting has remained relatively consistent with increased disbursements in 2016 and 2022. Last year, we did experience our best fundraising achievement in the history of our organization, and the grants do reflect this. As Education Matters 
operates on a calendar fiscal year, there was a carryover of some grants that weren't approved by CBE until early in the next year in 2022, thereby there'll be a little bit lower distribution in 2021 and also contributed to the increase in 2022. Uh, at the end of this year of May, our granting total was at $764,000, which is also an increase over past years. Since 2012, Education Matters has been working with CBE to raise funds specifically for fundraising priorities as identified by the school board and administration, most with great success. Collaborative development on the priorities provide an opportunity for Education Matters staff and volunteers to streamline our appeals to the community for support and meet the needs of the school and the school board. We've included this slide to give you a perspective of charitable distributions in an academic year, because we know we're a fiscal calendar, you are not, <laughs> you are an academic year. So as of May 31st, for this current academic year, we're at $1.6 million that has been dispersed. As you can see, the fundraising priorities and other granting initiatives um, are progressing well. As we are closing on the academic year, we anticipate there won't be a substantial change in the total distributions. However, we continue to fundraise and will continue to distribute grants as needed and appropriate. Some schools and departments do choose to delay further distributions until after September, uh, just because it better facilitates their timing and their, their planning in a school year and a budget period. Education Matters has consistently touched every quadrant of our city, as well as for other projects that we distribute system-wide. With the addition of processing of charitable donations for CBE, you may notice that some of the lists in, these, um, in this particular slide have changed from the years. Previously, Education Matters would show a vast majority of the schools as those who may have had higher identified needs according to their population of students. We now see a trend of having more schools with very active school councils who participate in their own fundraising campaigns. Education Matters still receives and receipts donations in the same way with the administration of the receipt to the funding process and the donation through to the grant. Um, our team continues to prioritize the higher equity designated schools for funding independently raised through the foundation or available funds through other donors, and we apply them to CBE identified priorities as much as we possibly can. Education Matters is also very proud to distribute approximately half a million dollars annually to support further education for students. This is along the line of the lifelong learning piece. The number of award applications decreased substantially in 2022. It was a trend we saw throughout the pandemic. Moving forward, we hope that we will increase that number of awards back to former levels. <laughs> um, but we are very encouraged that the number of identified unique students increased over the past year. And we are also very, very encouraged that this year for the 2022-23 academic year, we developed a substantial support for six students, two from James Fowler, one from Bo Ness, one Crescent Heights, Forest Lawn, and Lester P. Pearson High Schools, who each get $80,000 that will be provided to them at $20,000 a year for each of their four years of post-secondary. This was a very generous donation from a donor who chooses to be anonymous, and we hope they'll consider to continue this for future years. What a boon for the kids, though. Over to you, Henny. <coughs> Thanks, Marilyn. All right. <clears throat> now we've shared where we've been or where we are. <laughs> and now I'd like to present where we are going. We re revisited the trust indenture during our strategic planning process, which we finalized in late 2021 and simplified our vision, mission, mission and mandate. We exist to inspire investment from the community to enhance equity and alleviate barriers for CBE students. 
Our work is aligned with CBE priorities and is an instrumental part of our fundraising efforts. We have exceeded the amounts requested for CBE fundraising priorities and will endeavor to continue to do this. Education Matters operational mission and mandate expands on our defined purpose and builds on the desire of many community members to support the cornerstone of our society, public education, and to help our children become the future leaders of our city, country, and globally. We also develop five core values that are critical in meeting our mandate through a student-centric student approach. We then develop four specific priorities for Education Matters to focus with supporting objectives, specific activities to meet those priorities with target dates, and that roll into a board calendar to track our accomplishments. The four priorities that we have outlined above are, are in alignment with the CBE education plan. As you can see, the student is the focus around priorities, and we will endeavor to ensure that we will meet those priorities. Education Matters staff and volunteers continue to work to help CBE achieve its education plan objectives through supporting much needed programs and initiatives for students. Education Matters is aligned with CBE as our foundation also puts the students first and we ensure the wishes of donors are met to support public education based on the needs that teachers and administration see every day. Together, we can help fill gaps and create equity for every student every day. Through our strategic planning process and check-ins, our board and senior administration staff are building the conditions to work collaboratively, seek financial support, and complete the objective to provide grants and awards that will make a difference for CBE students. Measures are in place to ensure our plan is successful and can quickly adapt as necessary if the needs arise. And this was shown during the pandemic. And with our plans for development of donor-supported field of interest funds, we hope to expand our capabilities in responding to students' needs as they emerge. There are still many needs we need to develop for students following the pandemic. Education Matters will be there to help and lead the way in any way we can. The Education Matters Board of Governors are committed to developing a sustainability plan that will position us for many more years to come. <clears throat> In order to develop a successful sustainability plan, it will be necessary to have the support and alignment of all stakeholders, particularly the CBE at all levels. A joint effort and collaborative approach is required in order to meet the needs of students for the next 20 years and beyond in perpetuity. Our Sustainability Committee is reviewing all aspects of the organization, which include building efficiencies, areas of expansion, increasing revenues, analyzing costs, process enhancements, website functionality, use of social media, further increasing the return on investment, and most importantly, increasing the donor base and building relationships through donor engagement. Our Board of Governors priority is to present the sustainability plan to you, the Board of Trustees, in Q4 2023. And we will continue to work with you in developing this plan. 
All right. <clears throat> now for the, for the fun stuff. <laughs> it is clear from the above impact statements from 2022 that education matters is a critical component that contributes to students' success. Collectively, through a team effort approach between CBE and Education Matters, we will ensure the successful viability of the organization as we make a difference in the lives of our CBE students, and will continue to do so for many decades ahead. Every dollar spent towards supporting public education is a dollar well spent. I and everyone at Education Matters is looking forward to the journey ahead. It may be a bit bumpy, but we know that together as one united force that we can collectively make great things happen and ensure that equitable and enriched learning opportunities are available to all students. Thank you for your time today and providing Marilyn and I with the opportunity to share the 2022 results and path forward for Education Matters. Let's continue to work together to build a stronger and viable Education Matters. We welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Trustees with any questions or comments? Trustee Bolger, go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Marilyn and Hanif, for coming here today and presenting to us. So as a governor, um, just wanted to thank you both for your commitment to Education Matters as well as your staff. And in addition to all of our external governors, or not external, but other governors who bring their expertise and commitment as well to the organization. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you so much. Next on our agenda is item 7.2, the three-year system student accommodation plan 2023 to 2026. Chief Usi, would you please introduce the report? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Trustees. Um, today, we're pleased to present um, to the board the three-year system student accommodation plan, commonly referred to as the SSAP. Uh, this report comes to you during a year of record enrollment numbers and within the context of uh, projected enrollment um, for the 2023-24 school year that is anticipated to surpass this year's record enrollment. So the CBE is growing significantly, and that's good news. Uh, but we also recognize that uh, that pr presents some interesting op opportunities and challenges for us. Uh, the report before the board summarizes the projects and engagements completed during the current school year to optimize student accommodation within our schools. It also lays out the decisions that will be required uh, in the short term to address student accommodation pressures for the 2023-24 school year. And finally, it identifies the student accommodation challenges that are anticipated for the following uh, two school years. At this time, I will invite uh, Superintendent Brayton to provide additional details on this report, Madam Chair, and we'll, and we'll be happy to respond to questions from trustees. Thank you. Madam Chair and trustees, um, to expand upon Chief Superintendent Usi's comments, the plan before you provides an overview of the complex dynamics created as a result of a combination of factors that include such things as the record enrollment levels that we're seeing, um, the additional complexity created by the opening of new schools that, of course, then draw students out of existing schools over into the new schools, as well as the choices that students and families make on an ongoing basis in terms of where they live within the city and which of the you know, very wide selection of offerings that the CBE uh, provides that they might choose to best meet the needs, the educational needs of their student. This 
year's report, you'll note, also includes a bar graph that shows how the heightened enrollment levels are impacting schools, specifically in terms of schools in overflow. And so, you know, while the total number is shown as only being 18 schools that are being overflowed, um, it does represent a 50% increase from the previous school year. And so that's where you're seeing that uh, impact of the record enrollment. Uh, but again, it needs to be uh, placed in, into context of a total of 251 schools system-wide. And so certainly the CE continues uh, and will continue to have the capacity to welcome new students and, and uh, meet their needs. And since an important aspect of the SSAP is, of course, forward-looking, uh, for the upcoming 23-24 school year, and owing to the degree of unknowability in regards to where newcomers to Calgary will actually end up establishing themselves within the city, um, let me underscore that in addition to this once-a-year summary of schools that need to be monitored, monitored due to enrollment pressures, the CBE will be uh, monitoring schools on a weekly and a monthly basis, uh, this to ensure that we can act in an agile fashion to mitigate any pressures being caused in schools by record enrollment occurring in places that might not necessarily have been projected by this uh, plan. So in conclusion, uh, the report before you helps summarize the ongoing work that is done to ensure that CBE schools continue to adapt to rapidly changing demographics within the city. This to ensure that our students can continue to access world-class education in a school that is as close to home as possible. And so with that, uh, please to answer any questions you might have. Trustee Vukadinovich, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Hack. Uh, just for clarity, what is an overflow school? Is it the same as schools on lottery systems? And how does the school decide which students get access to an overflow school and which students have to go elsewhere? Through the chair. Um, so yes, an overflow school and a, a lottery school, uh, they're one and the same. Um, the difference between the language that's used typically has to do with when um, in the, the school year um, the student is registering for the school. So what I mean by that is if you have a student that is looking, for example, to apply uh, or register to a school for the new school year, and they're doing so at the same time as all other students are registering, um, well then what would occur is that their names are collected, and then by mid-February there's a lottery that's conducted. And so the process is the lottery, and so it's not necessarily the school that decides, it's the school administrating the process, and ultimately the process will result uh, in who gets in and who ends up being designated to the other school. Where it becomes an overflow is if a student, a new student, is looking to register within a school that is already uh, at capacity and cannot accept any more students, or they're trying to, so that's in year, or they are registering, they're a new student, they're registering for that school, um, but they're doing so after the conduct of the lottery. And so because of the fact that they've missed that, uh, that lottery process, then at that point in time, they would auto automatically be overflowed to their designated school, um, their designated overflow school or receiver school in that context. I hope that answers your question. I can't remember if there was another component to it. Uh, Trustee Dennis, go ahead with the question. Thank you so much. Um, so just a general question, and I just highlighted a few of the projects. So in particular, 23P12, which is Forest Heights and Redstone, 18P15, which is Manmeet Singular, 22P20, Saddle Bridge, and 22P5, uh, which is Grant McEwen and O.S. Geiger. So um, those are just a few examples. We have a number of schools where we are over or nearing capacity. Um, such as those examples I provided. And in some cases, such as Redstone, we do have a new school request on our capital plan, but of course, no guarantee when that school will be built. So considering the information in this um, three-year accommodation plan, 
for those schools where they are soon to be at or above the 95% utilization, how much notice do we hope to give those families should they find themselves in an overflow situation? Um, and then a related question is, you know, when would we consider modulars instead of going to an overflow? Through the chair. So the SSAP process intentionally looks to try to provide as much forewarning as possible. And, and that's why it's divided into the groupings it is. And so you've, you do have your long-term projects that are those 18 months and beyond projects already tracking and in, in the circumstance of overflow schools, of course, here we're talking about a school that is tracking towards being overutilized. Uh, but so already monitoring those schools as well as of course those other schools that might be underutilized but already starting to indicate that hey this school we are seeing a trend we're seeing something our projections are uh, letting us know that we had better continue to monitor see if things will resolve themselves over time or if actions need to be taken uh, but still it's at 18 plus month uh, forewarning then you get to the next short-term uh, component, which is that 18-month zone. And now if you are a school that's identified on that plan, and again, in an over overflow situation, uh, you were thinking about schools that would be nearing capacity or at capacity or starting to exceed capacity. So if I'm focusing just on those schools within that portion of the plan, already would start giving an indication that overflow might be a possibility, again, the CBE will be monitoring, will be observing, and, and considering different options uh, that will help maximize, again, the um, adherence with our, with the CBE um, student accommodation planning principles, those seven principles, again, one amongst them being uh, keeping students as close to home as possible, but of course there's a, a number of others. Um, and, so now we're starting to get closer. And then ultimately, when, it, when we're starting to um, act upon uh, those projects that are identified within the SSAP, uh, we definitely aim, as a minimum, to be providing 10-month notice. That being said, when we are experiencing enrollment like we are experiencing, in light of, as I mentioned previously, the unpredictability as to exactly where newcomers to Calgary will actually end up uh, settling and how where it might have initially started to impact one school uh, suddenly that movement of students from one school and, or m multiple schools to another school or multiple schools suddenly that pressure is being felt in a different location there are inevitably instances where we have to be reacting in year and at that point in time um, the notice can be very short that being said, for the families that were already part of that school community, they would already be in that school. And so if we are reacting in October, for, for example, because a certain school, let's call it School X, suddenly has reached its capacity, it is the newcomers who are arriving who will be overflown and as a result being directed towards the overflow school. So even if we had provided uh, you know, multiple years worth of prior notice, they probably wouldn't have benefited from that, to, not, notwithstanding because of the fact that they uh, would not have been in Calgary at that time, nor would they have necessarily known where they themselves would have uh, chosen to live. Um, but so that notice then is, can be very short notice, uh, but it's impacting of the new students that are registering to that school, so it is a, a smaller number of the population. Just a quick follow-up to that. Usually we, we try to aim for 10 months notice. I'm gonna pull up the, um, the North Trail High School, which is opening in the fall. Um, keep in mind that grade 10 and 11 open. Grade 12 will come the year after. With 10s and 11, it's projected to be at 88%. I guess, do we, do we have a plan? When will families know? Um, looking at that and looking a year ahead, even more so, 88% um, is gonna turn into a much higher number to match or exceed other high schools in the area that are already at 
or over capacity. Through the chair. Um, the beauty with high schools is that they do offer a higher degree of flexibility in terms of the programming uh, for students that allows us uh, and, and certainly the CB has uh, tremendous experience in this area uh, to operate high schools at above 100% and still be able to fully meet the needs of students at those high schools. That specific, you know, specifically being because of how um, the way the, the timetabling occurs for uh, the high school students means that they're not necessarily always in the same building. They're not uh, assigned necessarily to a homeroom, as you would see in the younger years. Uh, and so those additional degree of, of flexibility that, uh, that allows schools to operate at a higher level. Uh, and so th that being said, um, yes, we were certainly cognizant of the fact that enrollment at uh, that high school is, is very high. Um, it will be certainly one that we'll be looking at very closely after it opens. And then we'll have the benefit of starting to see the registrations for the next school year and, uh, and then taking it into consideration within the broader plan that uh, was uh, rolled out under the high school engagement that was conducted several years ago and to see if there are any more adjustments that might be required to, to adapt to the situation. But so at this point in time though, uh, nothing um, being planned or nothing about to be communicated if you want uh, on rega in regards to uh, enrollment for that school. Thank you. Uh, Trustee May, go ahead. So in continuing with the designation conversation, um, Families in New Brighton recently received a designation notice for the 2020-24 2025 school year that they, the incoming grade 10s would now be uh, attending Lord Beaverbrook School. Um, but now I'm seeing that it's now, Lord Beaverbrook's now on a list for Project 23-P45. I just want to make sure that, um, I, I guess I was a little bit concerned seeing it on the list and I want to make sure that um, we'll still be able to follow through with this, this three-year designation and that parents will be able to have the stability in knowing what high school to expect over the upcoming years. Through the chair. And, and certainly stability is, is an important element uh, uh, that you're referencing. And one where, especially in a high school uh, context, uh, we would uh, most definitely avoid at all costs uh, interrupting um, the path a student has undertaken. And essentially what I'm saying is that once a student enters a high school, uh, we want to ensure to the maximum extent possible that they can continue through that high school uh, while potentially, you know, the younger generations subsequently might end up being directed elsewhere, like in this circumstance that, that you just uh, described, Trustee May. So uh, our projections in regards to the re redesignation of New Brighton uh, to Lord Beaverbrook is that uh, we'll, the, 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 that community will continue to be um, uh, accepted within Lord Beaverbrook into the future. Um, Lord Beaverbrook is identified on the plan and it's in relation to uh, another two projects that are also on that plan. Specifically, I'm thinking of uh, James Fowler and Chinook Learning Services. And here it's, it's a question of um, looking to best serve Chinook Learning Services students while uh, maximizing the space within James Fowler and growing enrollment in Beaverbrook. And so we're, we're trying to protect that space for the, uh, the, those James Fowler, those Lord Beaverbrook schools that are filling up and continuing to uh, support uh, the, the students that Chinook Learning Services uh, manages to, um, to, to bring through to uh, high school completion. Trustee Vukadinovich, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Hack. On page 6 of 61, I see the sharp increase in the number of schools in overflow and the number of overflow receiver schools. There were 16 such schools in the 2019-2020 school year, and currently there are 44 such schools in the 2022-23 school year. One of the reasons I'm so proud to be a CBE parent and a CBE trustee is because at the CBE, we accept every student every time, and I heard you say earlier that the CBE continues to have space and capacity to welcome new students, and that's good news. But even though we can technically find space for every student who registers, the increase of schools in an overflow situation has a terrible impact on tens of thousands of families in Calgary. 
When a child cannot attend their local school because it is an overflow, then it breaks the bonds of community. For example, on page 17 of 61, this report says that the enrollment of Mount Royal Middle School jumped from 315 students in 2021 to 412 students in 2022. As a result, the kids attending Altador School in grade six this year will be split up among several schools. Those with siblings at Mount Royal were able to get into Mount Royal, while those without siblings are ending up at uh, two or more overflow schools. And these grade six kiddos had been expecting to continue their schooling journey together at Mount Royal Middle School. This is breaking the bonds of community. As another example, also on page 17 of 61, this report says that enrollment at Connaught School increased from 358 students in 2021 to 498 students in 2022. As a result, children who live even across the street from Connaught School have to be bused to two different overflow schools farther away, which is making it harder for neighbours with kids in Connaught to get to know other families with kids in their neighbourhood. And at the other end, when a school is designated as an overflow receiver school, it also breaks the bonds of community. This is because once it is designated as an overflow receiver, a school will start to have kids attending their school who aren't part of their neighbourhood, kids who don't live down the street for play dates or who don't show up to play at the same playgrounds on weekends. This breaks the bonds of community. And so I'm wondering, approximately how many families in Calgary are impacted by these 44 schools being part of these overflowed and overflow receiver schools? It looks like it's about one in five of our schools, so I imagine this impacts tens of thousands of families in Calgary. Through the chair. Um, so the, the school being overflowed um, is, that number is 18, not 44. Um, and, and so those students are from a designated area, typically a community. Um, I would say that they were the ones that are probably being impacted the most in the sense of their movement to a receiving school. Um, the receiving school will, of course, continue to accept their locally designated students and be able to continue to build the relationships they have within that community with those students. And now they have the benefit of potentially getting to know somebody else from a neighboring community. So. Um, I, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing, but it is 18 schools that are being overflowed, not 44. And, and, and so it's approximately 1,400 students. I don't know how many uh, families that might be, uh, but it's 18, uh, or 1,400 students approximately being overflowed from those 18 schools and that are having to travel to another neighboring community school as opposed to their normally designated community school. And uh, with that, I think maybe I'll just hand it over to Superintendent uh, Pittman for some additional comments. Through the chair, I would just add in addition, and, and certainly Superintendent Breton commented on the nature and opportunity within schools. I think it's important to recognize that each of our schools are quality, and while certainly there is an impact relative to transportation or different modes of accessing a building, the quality and community within each of our buildings does not change because it is designated as an overflow to receive additional students. And that is a really important element that we are very proud of across all of our schools. And in many cases, while there are adjustments that we need to make in year, when we have those increases, while those do create some level of disruption, the confidence that we have in our staff to connect and know each student as a learner and their family remains our priority. Trustee May, go ahead. I think I heard in my response, in the response to my Lord Beaver but question that we're looking to protect some space. Um, but I do have some concerns about what the south capacity will now be. Um, looking at the status, Centennial has a closed status, Dr. E.P. Scarlett has a closed status. Alternative High is a closed status, GCS is a closed status, and Lord Beaverbrook is limited, but it sounds like there's lots of pieces in play. So I'm just wondering, where are these new students going to go if everything's closed in the South? Through the chair. And so certainly we do have schools that are closed status, and that, what that means is that they're closed to out-of-boundary students or international students. And so they remain open for their designated communities. And so students that are designated to those schools will have the benefit of continuing to attend those schools. 
and uh, and and um, and it, it, where the impact again is going to happen is if if one of those schools offers, for example, a CTS program that is unique in the city, and somebody who doesn't have the benefit of living within the designated area wishes to attend that, they may not have that flexibility uh, to 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 ask to be transferred to that high school. Trustee may go ahead with your follow up. And to, just to confirm, does this also include like a year, I think they're called year four students, would that also limit them or would they be allowed to attend those schools? Through the chair, when we look at students who may require, who are under 19 and may require a year four or a fifth year of high school, there's consideration around what the best mode to deliver that programming may look like because frequently they're not looking for a full uh, schedule, it will be one or two courses that they may be able to access. So schools work individually with those students to make that determination. I would just go back to what Superintendent Breton highlighted as well. The closed designation was a really important control placed to manage high school transfers and it was a proactive move to ensure that designated students always had a space in the school they're designated to. And I think that's a really, it's been a significant amount of work across our system to work through that high school transfer process, but it really has uh, provided an important support alongside that. And then with our year four and year five to continue that planning and either utilize or access Chinook Learning, CBE Learn, or in some cases, students may access Discovering Choices as well depending on what their specific needs are. Thank you. Trustee Close, go ahead. Uh, a comment and a question. Um, Superintendent Breton, isn't it amazing that what a year, what a difference a year makes? And the questions and comments that you're receiving from trustees are all about uh, increased enrollment and overcapacity and how many schools we have uh, in overcapacity. And uh, I do know uh, from our conversations and even from the report that, that uh, CBE is dedicated to, to ensuring that students are feeling welcomed and, and, and can build community where they are. Um, but I'm gonna go back to the underutilized schools for a second. Um, uh, one of, the, and just a specific question um, around on page 728 around home education um, and maybe an intro to this is, I have had the pleasure of visiting Windsor Park School and meeting with the parents there. They're making a choice that, that is quite different from other parents' choices, but I'm really intrigued with that balanced uh, home education program and, and how successful we are at it. Um, but can you provide, when I read the report, uh, it, it, the question that came to mind for me is, can you provide more information on how our home education program at Windsor Park does not meet the current funding framework. Through the chair, I hear the issue is that we are offering the program within Windsor Park School. Um, that is a school that was previously closed. And so in the eyes of the government, it is, it is an administrative facility, it is not a school. And then how that connects to the funding framework is the funding framework only allocates funding such as O&M dollars, which, uh, so those are the operating and maintenance costs for heating, light, cleaning of the, the building, building, minor maintenance. Um, O&M funding, CMR funding, so the capital maintenance renewal, and, and the um, IMR funding, infrastructure maintenance renewal funding. All of those grants are tied specifically to operating schools. And so this, this building doesn't attract uh, any of that funding. And so then maintaining it in a sustainable fashion becomes more of a challenge. And so um, this is identified in, in light of the need to review how um, this program is currently being offered, essentially where it's being offered, and, and trying to address uh, its financial sustainability going forward from a facilities perspective. Trustee Close, go ahead. I just need to say out loud that that's a problem that we would love to solve, I'm sure. Trustee Vukadinovich, go ahead. 
Thank you, Chair Hack. Um, I believe when I said 44 schools earlier, I, I believe that's when I add up schools that are overflowed and that are overflow receiver schools because it, that's where the, I see the impact. So that was the number I saw on page six of 61. Um, and the fact that the CBE currently has 44 schools that are either in overflow or receiving overflow um, it makes me nervous uh, about how good of a job basically trustees are doing it, making the case for major modernizations, for replacement schools, for new schools. I like our provincial MLAs, they're a great bunch, they work hard for Albertans, uh, but earlier this spring with uh, the CBE with the largest market share in Calgary, with 60% market share in Calgary, um, we did not receive 60% of the capital planning announcements. And uh, our families desperately need new schools, is what I'm seeing from this SSAP. On page 9 of 99 of our 2024-2027 capital plan, we are listing eight priorities. Full construction funding for a new elementary school for Ed Edmonston. Full construction funding for a new high school for Cornerstone. Full construction funding for a new elementary school for Redstone. Design funding for middle school in Saddle Ridge and full construction funding for major modernizations at Annie Gale School, Crescent Heights School, AE Cross School and Sir John A. Macdonald School. These eight requests aren't a wish list, these are a must have list and if we have 60% of the market share in Calgary, I think it's only fair to families in Calgary that the CBE should receive 60% of the capital funding allocated for school construction and school capital projects in Calgary. So I know I'll be working hard this coming year, and my fellow trustees will too, to make the case to the recently elected provincial government that all eight of our priorities um, really for our families, uh, our families deserve to have those approved in the next round of capital planning announcements. Um, but my question is, if the CBE were to receive less than full approval and full funding for all eight of our capital requests this year, is there a risk that an even greater number of families in Calgary may find themselves impacted by uh, being part of overflows, overflow receiver, sh receiver and, and lottery situations next year? Through the chair, uh, even if today we received approval for full construction of every project uh, that is on the three-year school capital plan, um, I can guarantee you that there will be new schools that will be overflowing in the 23-24 school year because the three-year school capital plan will mean, once an approval is, is, is made off of that, will mean a multi-year process then to design and construct the building before it can actually be opened. And so, um, the ability to make those agile changes within the CBE, that's something that's completely within our control and not like, for example, again, a new school construction that is dependent upon the government to approve, to fund and to build, or the installation of modular classrooms that is again under the government's uh, you know, jurisdiction for approval, funding, construction of the modular, and then they hand it over to us. Making changes like overflows, making changes to school boundaries, making changes to school grade configurations are things that are entirely within uh, our approval uh, level and that we can implement on, on relatively short notice, obviously recognizing that we do aim to at least provide 10 months prior notice so that rec in recognition of the fact that families have to reorganize their lives when we make these changes. Thank you. Trustee Bukadinovich, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Hack. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, on March 22nd, 2023, the CBE Board of Trustees sent a letter to then Minister of Education, the Honourable Adriana Lagrange, requesting a review, uh, review of how utilization rates currently influence Alberta education, capital construction and modernization approvals, as well as operations and maintenance grant allocations as well as an associated review of how school capacities are calculated. So in a nutshell, the way the provincial government calculates capacity paints an inaccurate picture of how well utilized most of our schools are. And this is not a partisan issue because this, regardless of, this has been in place now for, for a number of decades so, uh, through, di through different uh, political parties in power. So, so not a partisan issue, more of a, a bureaucracy issue. And because the calculation is based on square footage and not on number of classrooms, 
we have schools in our CBE system where we would need to squeeze in 40 kids per class, even in kindergarten and grade one, in order to achieve 100% utilization. And this is why I'm worried that Calgary, Calgarians are not getting new schools in new neighborhoods. Um, and this is uh, why I think we're, we're seeing five, one in five of our existing schools being impacted by overflows and lotteries. Which, and I'm finding this uh, unfortunate because families in Calgary deserve better from, from uh, they, they just deserve better. So I'm really keen to hear uh, from the provincial government about whether the provincial government is willing to review how utilization rates are calculated. Now that a new cabinet has been sworn in, I'm wondering about our next step. Should the CBE Board of Trustees send a letter to the Honourable Minister Dimitrios Nikolaitis re uh, reiterating this request? As this isn't something that administration can answer, I'll take this one. Um, so with that letter that we sent, which was dated March 22nd, 2023, to Minister LaGrange's office. Um, that said, with the change in government, cabinet positions, that letter will live on with the office. Uh, first, I'd like to take a chance and send congratulations to Minister Nicolaitis. We look forward to working with you in the new role as Minister of Education. And Trustee Vukadovich, the letter our board sent will be transferred for response from his office now. Any further questions on the SSAP? Okay. That brings us to the consent agenda of our meeting. There were no items pulled from consent. As such, all items will be deemed to be approved with the agenda. That brings us to the conclusion of the public portion of the agenda. The board has two labor and one strategic planning matter to deal with in private. I'd like to thank all of you who joined us for the meeting. Our next public board meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, June 20th, 2023.